Hello, my name is Dawson Rule, and you're watching Knowing the Rules, episode number two. I'm here today talking about COVID vaccine mandates, and I've got a very special guest with me who I'll introduce in a second. First of all, I would like to say that COVID vaccine mandates are a topic of discussion, highly debated among politics, right or left, but at the end of the day, it's about people's health, which is the most important. So it's always an encouragement to get your vaccine if you agree with it. But we're going to dive in more into that with this episode with Dr. Randall Swain because we're going to be talking about not only healthcare workers being forced to get vaccine for the COVID, but also uh, regular workers. So without further ado, we will bring in Dr. Randall Swain from EKU to talk about this. Mr. Swain, how are you doing today? Very well, Dawson. Thank you for having me. It's good to be with you today. Well, uh, I always like to pull... EKU employees and bring them into the podcast because it's very important to to have them and show the local Richmond community and campus community who's on campus and who's working hard. So I'm glad to have you. Thank you. I'll start with our first question. Um, actually, earlier today, it seems like New York State recently mandated healthcare workers to get the COVID vaccine or be fired. So can you explain to people how the state is legally allowed to implement this mandate towards those workers? Sure. So anyone who works for a state agency or a state institution is liable uh, to the policies and the regulations that's passed by the executives, the head of those agencies. And ultimately, if you work for a state agency, at some point, your line of command, the person that you report to ultimately will wind up uh, to the chief executive's office, which is the governor. And so when we talk about the legality of, of, of mandates for people who work for hospitals, the thinking is that these mandates are liable or rather, rather, they're legally binding to medical care providers who work in public institutions where those uh, policies have been passed. Now, if you are an employee who, uh, rather, if you're a medical care provider who work in a private institution, then those state regulations don't, uh, they don't apply to you uh, ordinarily. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's generally, uh, generally, uh, generally speaking, those regulations, those mandates are binding on people who work for the institutions that fall under the authority who passes those, those regulations. Okay. Does that make sense? It, it kind of clears it up a little bit. You're kind of binded to it almost in a sense, right? So, so think of it like this. Um, a lot of times, uh, most students or even citizens, I would say, don't really understand how um, uh, you know, s simple things like um, executive orders work. And the thing to remember is that executive orders and mandates typically – when we see these things being issued, they're, they're issued by someone who was in an executive position. So when we think about executive orders at a presidential level, if you can envision it, those executive orders are binding on the people who work in the federal government because the president, by constitutional design, is the chief executive of the executive branch of government. So unless you work for the executive branch of government, then the presidential executive order does not technically affect you. In other words, a presidential executive order does not directly affect a government employee who works for a state government agency or a local government agency. But ideally, right, uh, we could see how that executive order could touch someone who, who, who was somehow in her, in, involved with that community. Because again, if that agency, in this case, the presidential executive order, if that, if that agency, if that executive branch agency has any dealings with the individuals who interact with that agency, if they go in that building, then they will come under the authority then to a certain degree, to a great degree of that executive order. And so when you're talking about a New York state mandate, that, that mandate applies to people who work for New York State, right? That, uh, you know, that, so 
if, if you work for a private hospital or if let's say you work for a federal government hospital, that state mandate would not apply to you. Now, if the president issued a mandate that all federal healthcare practitioners and federal workers get a, man, a COVID vaccination, then that would apply to people who work for the federal government. So the jurisdiction only applies to the level of government from which that order was issued. So if it's on a state level, they have to follow it there. But if it's on a presidential level and they work under that executive specific branch, then they must follow that regardless. And so, yes. So if, if so, a presidential mandate affects only people who work for executive branch hospitals or executive branch agencies. Okay. So does that create a difference where a couple of weeks ago, Biden had announced that he was making the nationwide mandate for businesses who had uh, 100 plus or more workers. What would the difference between that one be and the one with New York that was recently earlier announced today where it's for healthcare workers? Well, you know, as I, as I sit and think about this, I legally, I, I don't see how that would be binding or, or it'd be enforceable. Right. Uh, now, what you would need for something to be legally binding would be Congress passing a law or passing a bill and then the president signing that bill into law. So we, we have to look at the language. And so, you know, if you listen carefully, what I'm thinking, and I, I, I'll, I will have to, I, I fully admit, I, need, I will need to go back and kind of look at that story a little bit more closely and carefully. But as I just listened to you describe it, so a couple of weeks ago, he, and then the reason, I mean, these things are coming so quickly and so rapidly that, you know, every week we're seeing some progression, some, some new call for some new mandate. And in the instance that you're speaking to, uh, uh, basically, again, that would, as I understand it, that will only apply to employees who work in federal government agencies. So that's a, that's an order that would be issued that would apply to all federal governmental installations, whether it's military installations, federal government hospitals, parks. I mean, the federal, the reach of the federal government is extensive, uh, but that 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 mandate, let's say, would not affect you and I because we don't work for federal government institutions. Now, if we were to step foot on federal government property. Let's say we were to go to a federal park or a federal hospital or a federal military installation and and the president were to have issued that that order, then we would we would we would be required to to follow that order because they, at that point we are on federal government property. Does that kind of make sense? Would that but, be for every state regardless or would it be well again well so every state has federal government entities so if you think about kentucky for example we're here in madison county so if if the president did indeed pass that then still you and i are not affected by it now you and i are affected by a mandate that was passed by eastern kentucky university right so if we're on eastern kentucky university's property we have to wear a mask when we enter into a building that is owned by Eastern Kentucky. And anyone who comes and visits Eastern Kentucky University, even if they don't work for Eastern, Eastern Kentucky University, even if they are not a student at Eastern Kentucky University, by virtue of the fact that they're on Eastern Kentucky University property, they will be obligated to follow those, those policies, rules, and procedures because that's the that was the rule that was issued by President McFadden and the Board of Regents. And so anyone who is on our property, whether a visitor or a student, a faculty member or a staff member, they're obligated to follow that rule, okay? And then, but then once they leave, they are not obligated to follow that rule or that, or that obligation. Now, back to your question. So suppose that you or I were to leave Eastern Kentucky University and then drive over to Bluegrass Army Depot, which is just down the street. That's a federal government property. The moment we pass that gate and assuming that we were admitted into those grounds, then we would be obligated to follow President Biden's mandate because now we're on an installation that's controlled by the federal government. And again, President Biden is the chief executive by constitutional design of 
the executive branch of government. So wherever you have executive government property in any state, once you step foot on that particular property, and for those people who work there, employees, visitors, regardless, once that mandate is put in place, then they are obligated to follow those rules. Okay. Well, that kind of cleared it up a little bit more there, that last one. That was a good analogy. Um, Okay. So what would you think a correct response by the government and President Biden would be to Americans who claim that their freedoms are being taken away by such a mandate? You know, I that that's a good question. But the truth of the matter is that we 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 all have to at some point in time, we're required to undertake uh, certain type of vaccinations. If you go to school. Right. If you went to a public school, you had to have certain vaccinations or else you couldn't go to school. So the I guess the anecdote to that is that if you don't want to go to school or if you don't want to take the vaccination, then you have the choice to do that. But that just means that you cannot avail yourself of that public service. OK, so. Um, yeah, so if you, again, if this was a law that was passed, or not a law, because again, we have to clarify between mandates and orders and laws. A law is something, again, something that's passed by a legislature, signed by the chief executive. So if it's a law passed by the Kentucky state legislature and signed by the governor, that's applicable to everyone. If it's, signed, if it's a bill that's been signed by, if it's passed by Congress and it's signed by the president, that's a law that's binding on everyone. But when we're talking about mandates and executive orders, we have to keep in mind that those are limited in scope, generally speaking, to the properties and spaces that come under that jurisdiction. The example that I gave you, Eastern Kentucky University has a mass mandate that's only binding on Eastern Kentucky University property. So if you're if you're not stepping foot on Eastern Kentucky University property, then you're not obligated. And that doesn't really apply to you. So you couldn't really you couldn't really effectively say that your your rights were being were, were you know were being trampled upon, right? You couldn't say that they were being obliterated, you know, um done away with because you you don't have to come on campus, okay? You don't have to, I mean, if, 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 if you felt like this was something that was really, really an imposition and you had a real problem with it, then again, right there, I mean, you always have a choice. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably not the answer that you're looking for, but I, I think in terms of trying to strike a balance, we have to remember that again, um, and there are going to be some people. There, will, I imagine that there are going to be some nurses, there will be some doctors, who feel so strongly about this that they will elect to walk away from their, you know, their their positions. They will resign their positions in hospitals and and in other uh, positions involving federal government property because they feel that strongly. Um, about about the vaccination. And, and I get it. I mean, there are some individuals who just because, unfortunately, because of the misinformation, uh, a lot of a lot of individuals just have questions. Um, and that's unfortunate, but that's the reality you know, that, that we live in. Right? People question everything and that has implications that has that has consequences. And so when this in this instance, if we step back and look at it, the science it's clear that mass, that mass plays a significant role in reducing the spread of COVID-19. There is no denying the data that says that vaccinations work, right? When you look at who's in the hospitals now, uh, yes, you do have a few breakthrough cases, but it's overwhelming. 95% of the cases, maybe even more, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, the, the individuals, who have COVID-19 are unvaccinated. And presidents and governors who are inclined to do so are making those decisions based on the science. And so again, um, for those who, who, who question that or who don't want to 
again, you know, part of those rules. And I think about this as a, as again, as a, as a, as a, as an employee of EKU. Now, again, I, I, I have no qualms in telling you that I'm fully vaccinated. I'm, I'm proud to say I am because I, I'm just one that believed that I am my brother's keeper, as it were. And so I wear a mask. I'm vaccinated not because I'm afraid of someone else giving me the disease. I feel like I'm certainly I'm, I'm, I'm fairly healthy. I try to work out, try to watch what I eat. I try to get proper sleep. So I, I you know, I feel that um, knock on wood that I would be less likely to catch it from someone else. But I do realize that I could be a carrier. And so because I care about the people that I come into contact with, the students that I come into contact, I feel obligated that I should do everything in my in my power to help someone else to not get it. And so when I wear a mask, it's not that I'm afraid of catching it from someone else, because as I look at the research, the mask doesn't protect me from uh, incoming droplets, but it, it rather it's more of a barrier from keeping my you know my my droplets from reaching someone else. And so someone doesn't want to, if doesn't want to, again, I, I work at EKU, so I, I would imagine that if someone doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to, you know, abide by their rules, those, those you know, the, the, the policies that were uh, initiated and invoked by the president and the board of regents, you know, they have that, they have that right. They don't have to, I and mean, there is no law that says you have to get an education, but that you have to have a job. This is what Eastern Kentucky University says is the best way to keep the community safe. And so anyone who comes on the campus, whether it be student, whether it be staff member, a visitor at a football game now, or, or any other event, if, if they were to try to you know, enforce those policies, they have a legal basis of doing so. And I, I can't see how someone would say it's an imposition on my civil liberties or civil rights to be able to have to wear a mask when at the end of the day you have the freedom to again to to not come and i i do realize that that sounds trite but i say that to say that i i feel like we're in an environment where people invoke my rights too often and too quickly i mean no one is being arrested no one is being threatened because they don't have a vaccination right no one really i was always taught by my parents no one owes you a living no one owes you an education. If you if you want an education, if you want you know a job, you have to go out and get it. You have to go and work for it. And it just so happens that if I'm if if, if these endeavors that I want to pursue happen to be in private or public institutions that have instituted these mass mandates, I have a choice as to whether or not I want to submit myself to that and to consider and produce, you know, pursue my endeavor or not. Well, that kind of clears it up a little bit with the difference between a law and a mandate, because lots of people have freaked out, but not followed the mandates, although there is no punishment typically for not following one in some stores. So um, I guess that could bring us to our final question here. So back to the New York story a little bit. Um, okay. I, I have my stat here. Uh, up to 83,000 people can be fired from their healthcare job in New York. So do you think that a healthcare worker, one of those 83,000 potentially, who exposes himself to COVID patients every day, has any real chance of fighting for their job if they wanted to take it to court or if they wanted to fight it? Would they have any real chance of maintaining their job? Yes, of course. I mean, there are always extenuating circumstances. I mean, let's, again, and the thing about our the thing about our legal system is that it looks at individuals on a case by case basis. So if you can generate and produce documentation that's compelling that that suggests if you take this vaccination and your life could be at risk because you have an underlying and for some individuals there's a concern because of an underlying medical condition. So we put a lot of emphasis on the people who catch COVID and then because of an underlining condition or a comorbidity, they're more likely to be a fatality. But I, I wonder 
what diseases or chronic conditions are out there that would keep people out there, who, people who have real concerns? What if you have a pacemaker? Or what if you have a, 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 an embedded defibrillator? Well, what if you have AFib? Now, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not, I'm not a medical. I'm not an expert by any means. But just as a rational person, I can envision there would be certain circumstances where out of 83,000 people statistically, it stands to reason that some of those individuals have real world compelling issues that have to be balanced against other concerns and considerations. And, and ultimately, that's going to be something that some adjudicatory board will look at and determine whether that reason is, is a compelling enough reason for someone to not get a vaccination. But again, you raise a very good point. Um, what, you know, at, at what point does that particular person who has this, who's not vaccinated, impose a risk to you know, someone else in the hospital, whether it be a patient, a coworker, a staff member, what have you. And so these are the type of questions that I think as a society we'll, we'll continue, you know, we'll continue to have. You know, my hope is that we can have these discussions without it being politicized and without the demonization. Uh, that's, that's the unfortunate thing that, that we see ourselves where we are now in terms of what I would call the balkanization of our political discourse, where this issue has become politicized, where if you wear a mask, if you are pro-vaccine, that must mean by default that you're a progressive liberal. And if you are anti-mask or you're anti-vaccination, it must mean by default that you're conservative. And that's unfortunate because I think uh, there's a lot more beneath the surface that, that really warrants having a, a real world discussion. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that at the end because kind of at the beginning when I announced about the vaccine, I kind of mentioned, yeah, it has been politicized. I feel like it has, and that kind of takes away from the discussion almost. So I'm glad that you were able to say that and get it out there because it, well, you were on the ball with that. If you wear the mask or take the vaccine, you're liberal. If you don't, Well, you know, people – I didn't mean to cut you off. You know, people are literally dying because of the politics, you see. And that's a lot of, a lot of the misinformation that's, that's proliferating out there, right? I mean, it's literally proliferating, right? Misinformation. And people are basing life-changing decisions, life or death decisions on misinformation. And again, when it's politicized, and propagandize, to me, that makes those lethalities, th those cases where a loss of life occur, it really makes it so much, uh, so much more devastating to me, right? because it didn't have to happen. Well, that's all the questions I got for you today. I really appreciate you joining me, and you're giving me a great amount of information that we're going to be able to show to everybody. And um, once I have this up in a few weeks, I'll have it on my social medias to post it. And so more EKU students and EKU employees and people of Richmond can see this and get to know a little bit about who you are then research you as a professor since you are in the, per, uh, the Department of Government at EKU. So I just really appreciate you being here and talking with me today. Sure, thank you for having me. And I, I hope that I've been able to, again, uh, add some value and insight and uh, hopefully have made a, or will make a, a positive contribution to this uh, discussion, uh, at least moving us towards a more positive discourse. You know, I think if, if we can do that, then this whole endeavor, the time that we spent together today will have been worth it. So thank you for having me. And I think that in the end it will have because we had a great discussion. So thank you very much, Mr. Swain. Be well. Thank you. You as well. Thank you.